One of Wisconsin's largest cities shuts down for one summer as woodworkers fight to attain rights. Widespread involvement and outside help made this strike one of the biggest in state history. Oshkosh woodworkers displayed the power of labor unions by standing up to local lumber barons through strike and in court. The whole nation was watching as Oshkosh influenced the fate of laborers everywhere through the Oshkosh Woodworkers' Strike of 1898. By 1866, Oshkosh was the second largest city in Wisconsin. With its first lumber mill established in 1847, the lumber industry grew and Oshkosh was deemed Sawdust City. The Payne Lumber Company was the biggest sash door and blind company in Sawdust City and in America. Oshkosh was the ideal place for lumber mills due to its location on the Fox River. The Fox's connection with the Wolf River enabled lumber from the north to be sent directly to Oshkosh. In 1859, the railroad arrived in Oshkosh. Manufacturing boomed and continued to due to Civil War demand. Organized labor in Oshkosh started in the late 1880s with the establishment of two Knights of Labor affiliate groups. In the 1890s, the American Federation of Labor, known as the AFL, was picking up prominence in America. In 1891, the AFL chartered the Oshkosh Trades and Labor Council. Woodworkers were the last trade to unionize in Oshkosh. Thomas Kidd was the leader of the Amalgamated Woodworkers Union in Chicago and would eventually be the vice president of the AFL. Kidd came to Oshkosh in 1892 to help establish Local No. 29, the first woodworkers union, and Local No. 57, a German-speaking woodworkers union. Unionization efforts were put to a halt due to the overall hardships of the Panic of 1893. Oshkosh sawmills shut down temporarily, and when they reopened, they cut wages by 10%. Later in 1898, Oshkosh woodworkers were promised a wage increase, but never received it. And then the Spanish-American War in April of 1898 caused sharp inflation on food prices, making reduced wages even harder to live off of. By 1898, Oshkosh woodworkers had the lowest wages in the whole country. Low wages hurt the laborer, but gave Oshkosh an edge in the lumber industry nationwide. The Chicago Dispatch named Oshkosh the pauper labor center of the world because Oshkosh woodworkers earned a dollar for every two seventy-five Chicago woodworkers made. Also, women and children made up one-tenth of Oshkosh mill workers and were paid 55 cents a day. To address these issues, labor leader Thomas Kidd came back to Oshkosh to help the workers again. On Sunday, May 8th, as a last-ditch effort before calling a strike, the woodworkers wrote up a letter of demands to send to the mill owners. Their demands included a minimum wage proposal, a weekly payday, and union recognition. The woodworkers received no response. It was then that the whole city summer was turned upside down by the woodworker strike. Eggs would be thrown, riots would occur, conspiracy charges would be filed, but ultimately victory would come to the laborers in court. Given his experience and expertise, Thomas Kidd was the strike leader. And on Monday morning, May 16th, 1,600 woodworkers, about 75% of all the woodworkers in Oshkosh, walked off the job and participated in massive picket demonstrations. Kidd involved the wives and daughters of woodworkers in the strike meetings held weekly at Turner Hall, giving the women of Oshkosh a role in the strike. About 75% of the strikers were German. Language barriers were not an issue for Kidd because of Dick Braunschweig, his German orator. Eliminating the language barrier broke new ground for immigrants who were previously on the sidelines of the labor movement. To ensure the strike would last, Kidd set up a relief fund that was supported by other Wisconsin and Chicago unions. The relief fund gave strikers $3 a week, about half of their normal wage. Unexpected support came from mill owners across the country that wanted Oshkosh to unionize so their businesses could compete with this low-wage town. William Rock, a mill owner from Iowa, came to Oshkosh in support of the strike for the sake of his own business. Oshkosh leadership and mill owners responded to the growing presence of the strike. Mayor A.B. Eidson hired a larger police force, and mill owners hired Pinkerton detectives, a common tool used by businessmen to infiltrate unions. Mill owners hired temporary employees, also known as scabs. Despite these obstacles, woodworkers shut down two mills by the end of May. On June 1st, Kidd had AFL leader Samuel Gompers speak to the strikers. Gompers also met with two mill owners to discuss the union. 
Eventually, the woodworkers' wives took matters into their own hands, inciting a riot at the Macmillan Company. They terrorized the scabs by throwing rotten eggs, salt, and pepper. To try and stop the riot, an engineer from the Macmillan Company, Edward Casey, sprayed the strikers with a hose. Casey also fatally struck James Morris, a 16-year-old paint employee, in the head with a club. Morris died four hours later due to his fractured skull. The Union saw James Morris as a martyr. They held a large funeral for him and buried him in Riverside Cemetery in an unmarked grave. Resulting from the Macmillan riot, Wisconsin Governor Edward Schofield sent a request for the National Guard to come to Oshkosh. But the presence of the National Guard proved unnecessary because Macmillan settled with the Union and increased wages 15 cents a day. By July 2nd, all of the mills had made negotiations with the Union or had been shut down. Mill owners were anxious for the strike to end. But rather than negotiating with the Union, mill owners set out to undermine the Union's legality. Even though the 1842 Massachusetts Supreme Court case, Commonwealth v. Hunt, established that labor unions are legal. George Payne found a judge who would file an injunction against Kidd. On August 5th, Judge Goss heard the complaint against Thomas Kidd, George Zetner, and Michael Trober. The three were accused of criminal conspiracy against the Payne Lumber Company. They were then arrested but let off on bail. The mill owners were successful in ending the strike, which was called off on August 19th. However, national involvement grew as the union shifted their focus to an innocent verdict for the three men. The trial was held October 14th at Oshkosh's City Hall. Clarence Darrow, who had previously worked with Kids Union in Chicago, served as the defense attorney. Darrow had gained fame for defending Eugene V. Debs in a conspiracy case relating to the Great Pullman Strike of 1894. This time, however, Darrow's defense would be successful. To ensure Union victory, Darrow focused on the jury selection process, which took four days. With the odds against him, Darrow still put together a favorable jury composed of mostly working-class people. When Wisconsin vs. Kids started, Darrow made excellent use out of sympathetic witnesses and discredited the prosecution. First, Darrow brought up instances of child labor at the Payne Lumber Company. Six boys testified that they all started at 13 years or younger. The last witness for the defense was Andrew Ryan, a secretary of Woodworkers Local Number 63. Ryan stated that Nathan Payne, son of George Payne, offered him $2,500 to provide documents to use against certain parties. Darrow also made good use of witnesses for the prosecution. On October 21st, during George Payne's cross-examination, Darrow got Payne to admit to hiring Pinkerton detectives to spy on the strike. Darrow also asserted that if anyone was guilty of conspiracy, it was George Payne and the other mill owners who had used the legal system to conspire against and arrest Kidd and shut down the union. On October 28th, Darrow passionately delivered his final arguments for eight hours without notes. Darrow defended Kidd by stating that, Ordinarily, men are brought into a criminal court for the reason that they are bad. Thomas Kidd is brought into this court because he is good. Darrow spun the conspiracy on the pains again, stating that the mill owners pursued these defendants in the false name of the state of Wisconsin for the sake of teaching these men that if they ever dare again to assert their rights, the door of jail will open to receive them. Darrow then emphasized the significance of this case, making the jury aware that an innocent verdict would be, quote, a milestone in the history of the world. The jury only took 50 minutes to decide an innocent verdict for all three men. The innocent verdict was extremely important because the woodworkers won their right to protest in the eyes of the law. Although the strike was important locally, the trial decision had the potential to impact communities throughout the entire nation. Like Commonwealth v. Hunt influenced decisions at the state level, Wisconsin v. Kidd could influence other decisions at the municipal level. If the verdict had come back guilty, other local-level companies could have followed the Payne's example and used conspiracy charges to wipe out local unions. The injustices Oshkosh woodworkers faced attracted national attention and support. The woodworkers were backed by the AFL, Samuel Gompers, and Clarence Darrow, major symbols in the labor movement. Even though the strike didn't force local-level companies to meet all of the workers' demands, the trial confirmed that a union's legality cannot be undermined. Oshkosh woodworkers were heroes to labor in 1898 and heroes to labor today. 
they took the first step necessary in the long and continuing journey of labor victories.